again, an investment in yourself. So Roz, you know, we were talking about this week about, you know, favorite things that happened. I know something favorite and special happened for you. Can you go ahead and share your big news? Yes. I bought a house and I got the keys um, on Thursday. And oh! Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for, for me, like us talking about stocks and investing and all of these things, there's, there's so much that to explore within that, but having the ability or, or gaining the knowledge for how to invest safely is definitely a big driving force in being able to come up, come up with a down payment with being able to actually purchase a house and making sure that I'll be able to have money to pay for the mortgage going forward. <laughs> That's, uh, that might be important. <laughs> very important. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is something that I, I've been working really hard towards. My, my family, I, I guess technically we would be considered low income. Um, and, and so for me to be able to make this step by myself is, is really humongous. And, um, yeah, it's a favorite thing for me this week. It's good to, to see a, a strong black Amazing. woman smash through and own her own property is incredible. Uh, Roz, uh, not to, you know, sun you, but I'm incredibly proud and I, I think it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Party at Raj's. Oh, the yeah. Post pandemic. Oxtail. <laughs> Welcome to the Technically Diverse Podcast featuring the Quadcast crew. <laughs> Welcome to episode number six of the Technically Diverse Podcast. We are located at the intersection of technology and cultural diversity. I am your host, Jordan. And joining me, as always, is the Quadcast crew. Co-hosting the pod and our resident adrenaline junkie is Ruby, a.k.a. Amsako. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Behind the scenes and working his magic is Uncle Mike. Remember, if it ain't Mike, it ain't right. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and keeping us in line and doling out the law and order is our producer, Roz, a.k.a. Peaches. Hey. So on today's pod... We're going to cover off some updates because it's really annoying when you listen to podcasts and they, they talk about things in past episodes and then they, they never come back. So we're going to talk about the farmer's protest. We're going to give you a little sneak peek at what's been going on as we test out the different messaging applications. Um, and then we'll, we'll dive into, um, you know, what's the, the, bub, the hubbub and what's been going on with Wall Street versus Reddit. Um, and we'll, we'll chat a little bit about entrepreneurship, and then we're going to have a special guest interview in this episode. So stay tuned. Um, the Technically Diverse podcast. Here we go. So, Ruby, you know that, um, you know, something happened this past week. It was Bell Let's Talk Day. And I know one of the themes for the podcast that we really want to establish is mental health. It's something that, you know, people of color sometimes are stigmatized about. And, you know, there, there is a stigma about, you know, speaking up about what's going on. Um, I know that you mentioned that, um, you know, it's super important to talk about mental health. And I wanted to acknowledge Bella Let's Talk Day because it had a really great effect on the community over the past couple of years. And I want to take this moment in the pod to establish and let everybody know that you can expect future, future updates on mental health and it's definitely going to be a theme woven into some of the episodes that we have coming up yeah and I think um, just tying in leveraging social media platforms to bring awareness and resources to to causes like this you know I know in our past uh, podcast we talked about the spread of misinformation but I think it's also imperative to talk about how you can leverage social media to get awareness to for great causes so with Bell Let's Talk um, if you you know include that hashtag uh, Bell Media actually donates five cents for every time somebody uh, uses that hashtag, right? And just, and I think everybody's talking about this because it's impacting everybody differently, more so than others at times, but with the pandemic going on. And I think it's important we constantly address it and bring awareness to it and bring resources to our listeners, to ourselves, um, and also what other organizations and what they're doing from different platforms to bridge those gaps and to eliminate those stigmas that are prevalent in our communities. And, and, and that's absolutely uh, perfect. And I, you know, again, you just hit a home run with what you said. Um, Bell Let's Talk 
uh, you know, we've seen a lot of corporations really, really get involved. And I saw like a lot of sports teams this year. I, I saw a really cool post with um, every MLS soccer team um, chimed in and, and tweeted out, you know, we're in this together. Um, Bell Let's Talk Day in support of Toronto FC, which, um, you know, is really promoting, uh, you know, Let's Talk Day. And uh, I think it's just overall a great initiative. Ruby, you touched on just now social media and, um, you know, the way it's impacted this. Let's circle back to the farmers protest because that was another, you know, subject that was near and dear to your heart. You know, it personally impacted you. And um, can you give us an update on what's been going on? Yeah, I would say to begin, there's a lot to unpack here and there's a lot of, you know, overlapping uh, and connecting uh, issues that tie into a lot of things we've been having a conversation about, whether it be WhatsApp and Facebook, whether it be about mental health, whether it be about, about just what's happening at, hap, happened at the Capitol. Um, so the latest update I'll, you know, bring up, there's been some some developments. So January 26th was a day of the tractor rally, and it was also Republic Day in, in India. And what the ultimate um, uh, result was that, you know, the protests went awry. And I would say by, you know, the, the government itself, the BGP party, which is, you know, a Hindu nationalist party and have their own agenda and have been trying to drive the narrative that this is not a farmer's protest. It's a Khalistani movement. And so Khalistani movement is um, a movement that was uh, started as a result of what happened in 1984, which was the Sikh genocide. And, and there's, a, there's a deep dive into that itself, but um, the government uh, media have claimed, you know, that separatist movement of the Sikh people as a terrorist uh, a group. So it really is about keeping front and center that this is the farmers' protest about repealing those three laws that were put in place. Um, and I think a lot of what the Sikh community was doing was trying not to bring to attention um, and minimize who they were, minimize that they're Sikhs. Um, the population in India, 2% of the population are Sikhs, whereas 20% of the um, army uh, consists of Sikhs. So there's there's a lot of conversation around if how can we be terrorists and it just like I if said you're in the like, army. We're in the army. Like to be labeled as a terrorist when the cause is to repeal these farmers' protests, the laws. So what ended up happening on that day is the government actually disconnected not only the internet, which the UN declared is a human right to have access to 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 the internet exactly they, which it should be <laughs> exactly and they they cut off water uh, electricity at all those protesting sites um they drove the narrative that this is what the terrorists are doing there was um a misdirection so there's um places that were put in on the route of the pre-approved route of the uh, tractor rally where police uh were set up and as people were you know uh, on this route, there are diversions that were, you know what, fairly well known to be diversions created by the police to create uh, now a place and a situation where the police could say that these are terrorists that have taken down the, taken down the barricades. And, and is that, is that like that picture that you shared with me? Because you shared with me some really gruesome images of, you know, people being, it looked like they were being beaten up. And I'm like, why is uh, a police officer stepping on someone's head? Like that does not seem legitimate. Absolute police brutality. And remember when I was saying that this farmer's protest consists of 80 year old people, the grandmothers and grandfathers that are there fighting for the future of the rights for their children to carry on and be able to have a livelihood. Um, so absolute police brutality, and then drove the narrative that these are terrorists. And then, you know, hoisted a, a flag, which is, they depict it as a terrorist flag. It is actually uh, a flag that symbolizes our faith. And it wasn't uh, any flag that took down any other Indian flag. And even when we talk about the Indian national flag it represents you know all religions it rep we 
if you notice that every tractor, every protester was carrying an Indian flag. So there is no question here that their terrorists are working against the, the nation. What, what's so, the other flag that they were? You, you so just it, it's what's a symbol it of the Sikh fake. So it was the Nishan Saib that was put up on the Red Fort. Um, not at all a, a symbol of terrorism, but a symbol of our faith. And and the other thing I want to drive at home here is the Sikh faith. And faith is the reason I bring up that our Sikhs are predominantly you know, being the lowest of the population and fighting um, in a lot of, you know, at the borders and standing up with their bravery is we stand up for injustice. That is what is in our blood. Like that is what we advocate for. So when we're now diverting this conversation around, it's not farmers protest that the Sikhs are trying to put forward their agenda of this separatist movement. We want to own that we are able to also protest as Sikh farmers. We're not gonna diminish the fact that we are Sikhs, but we're also, if you notice, the farming protest is happening for farmers that are in the North, that are in the South, that are in the East and the West, that has a, that combines not only the Sikh faith, but the Hindu faith and the Muslim faith. This is a fight for the farmers to have those bills repealed. So it seems like it seems like a, a case of cherry picking here because you know this the Sikh faith is being used to diminish these farmers' protests and to draw attention to the Sikh faith being misrepresented as some sort of you know terrorist group when that's not true, um, and that you know this this farmers' protest and the issues around it are are you know being politicized and you, people are leveraging you know the Sikh faith to drive divisiveness. Is is that a fair to sum it up? Yeah, and you know what, and what I want to end with is, and I, there's a lot of great, um, you know, resources to follow on Instagram and Twitter, and I'd also brought up uh, Kalsa Aid in our last um, podcast, and so Kalsa Aid is uh, an organization that provides uh, relief efforts to any humanitarian um, cause that requires it, whether it be in Haiti when, you know, they were hit with, uh, with the hurricane, whether it be, you know, in Syria, what, wherever. Um, they're up for a Nobel Prize. Oh, and wow. the, the Indian government just declared them as a terrorist group. So that could just tell you that, just, that, that indicates how Indian government is trying to really drive the narrative away from, you know, like, I can't even call the Indian government as a democracy. There, it, there's all the things that they're doing is not democratic. They're, they're really impinging on the ability to have a peaceful protest. And that was a result of what happened on January 26th. The farmers are still back and still protesting peacefully. And that's what they want. They want to continue a peaceful pr protest, but have the, have the right to protest but the government, by cutting off internet, cutting off in, uh, electricity, cutting off the means to now get food uh, for them to be able to eat day to day, is really hindering that. And there's a lot of human rights violations that are happening right now. Um, and that, like that, that to me sums it up what's happening and the way we need to support is a lot of, you know, the UK government, the Canadian government and, um, you know, we're signing petitions and I'll, uh, we'll join that to our link um, so people know where to sign up, but it is to uh, stand up to allow for the peaceful protest to continue and the in Indian government not to interfere because they are supposed to be a democratic nation and Ruby. they should be held accountable for that. I, I, I can't thank you enough for, you know, taking the time to do more research on this and for covering this for us. Um, you know, we're definitely going to continue to stay dialed in and we look forward to future updates on what's going on. Um, as you mentioned, now, there, we will be linking um, to various organizations and ways that people can get involved in show notes and across social media. So, um, you know, we, we definitely want to see this you know, resolve with, with a positive outcome, but we'll continue to, you know, provide coverage um, in the ways that we can and uh, shed some light on some of these the, these weird intricacies that, that seem to be happening to um, destabilize the movement. Um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the information that you've been sharing on this, we've been doing so across our, our messaging apps. And I thought it would be a good idea today to, to talk about What's been going on in the messaging apps because 
they've gotten more robust and Roz's favorite from last time, Telegram, has added a bunch of new flav- uh, fa- flavors. Well, flavors maybe. <laughs> uh, added a bunch of new features to to be more mainstream and so a signal. So Roz, uh, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about some of those features that you like so much? Um, I know you sent a big long thing in our group and you were really, really excited. Yeah, so I... We figured out how to reply to messages. That was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is on Telegram, folks. Yeah. So we're, we're talking about on Telegram. Telegram, here. yes. So we now know that we got to slide to the left instead of the right, like we do on every other app. Um, another thing is they've been announcing that they have what I think it's over fifty or five hundred million users now. They've updated some of the. Uh, messaging settings so now you're able to delete messages for everyone regardless of when it was read you're able to import all of your messages from other apps this way you'll still have yeah this way you'll still have all of your your history so you can view that so your messages from whatsapp or or from your from your um, sms messenger on your phone you you're able to view all of that history when you're chatting with people now uh, there's a few other things. I don't remember them, unfortunately, but it's, a huge list. it's been, posted. <laughs> yeah, it's a very big list. Um, and, and one of the other great things is that I, I feel like it's a lot more customizable than WhatsApp mm-hmm. was. And, and I appreciate that. I love being able to make things, whatever colors I want. <laughs> Definitely. With the, the chat backgrounds was really, um, was really, really cool. Uh, I, it's one feature I really did like in, I, I do like in WhatsApp and to see that now on Telegram is, is pretty cool. And I really feel you when you say it's more customizable, it seems like you can go deep. Um, you can kind of tell it's a pure Android app just on how customizable it, it can be. Um, I know Uncle Mike and I, we really liked Signal. Um, so, you know, I was glad to see that um, Signal also added um, the ability to customize backgrounds and colors. Um, they were reporting a huge spike in users adopting the application. And it seems that now they're taking steps to make it a little more mainstream, which is cool. Um, I'm hoping that the the app still remains really, really clean. It's it's one of the, the things I really like about it. It's very pragmatic. And I, I hope that as they add features, they're just careful to stay in, um, you know, and stay stay within uh, the, I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Just, they, I just want them to stay in the lane and make sure that they stay true to what the app is about and, and, and not go just tacking on features for the sake of just tacking on features. See, I kind of disagree with you there. I personally hate the GUI on Signal, and and I sorry, feel like the they, what? they need to the what the graphic user interface, aka the, GUI. There's no you, other way of pronouncing there's no, it. There's no, there's no, not in the world. There's no other way to say. There's that. no other way to pronounce oh, okay, it. Now. Okay, okay, all right. If you'd like, you can share with our listeners the way that you say it, even though it's wrong. Oh, oh so myself and pretty much everybody else, uh, you know, that are technology professionals, including. Mr. Uh, Uncle Mike, who's, you know, been a long standing. Yeah, actually, Uncle Mike, you've been in the technology industry for, like, how long now? Like, uh, uh, how many years have you been in the tech industry? We won't talk about how long I've been here. It's been a long time, but (laughs) it's uh, a gooey. It's a gooey, right? (laughs) Okay. All right. Anyways, back to the point. Ongoing debate. (laughs) The uh, the G-U-I on Signal, I feel like it's bare bones. I I, I don't love it. It's not customizable, and it just looks plain and basic. Telegram, it's cute. I, I, I feel it. It's cute. Oh, it's, it's cute. I'm so happy yeah. it's cute. Just like when you showed us your nails earlier and you did the little, like, thingy. My nails happened. were not cute. They're all broken, everyone. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, My you know nails what? are like Signal. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Oh, you're Signal hater. Well, we'll see. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pivot back. I think we should. it's only fair that we pivot back to Signal maybe for the next week and give it another go around because we've been abusing Telegram like crazy. And uh, we'll continue our ongoing coverage. The one thing that we touched on during, um, you know, our social media episode where we talked about these apps was the fact that competition is good for users. It's good for consumers in generally any industry. So now that we're seeing more features come to market, there's probably going to be more innovation on top, on top of these features and how they're used. And we get to benefit from that. So I think that's completely excellent. On that note, we're taking a break. We're going to come back and we're going to discuss Wall Street versus Reddit. Okay. okay, so folks, welcome back. You know, we're going to go straight to Uncle Mike on this hot one. It's been one of the hottest stories of the week. Um, you know, there's been a lot going on between Wall Street versus Reddit. It's it's almost like WrestleMania, what's been occurring. <laughs> and the it's amount David of... David The fever, exactly. So mm-hmm. Uncle Mike, you... 
you know, have dabbled with day trading. I know you like to brag to me about your stocks all the time. Why don't you go ahead and tell me? Brag. I have nothing to brag about. <laughs> you, you're not one of the people that posts no. on Instagram about your stock no. moves? That's no. not you? Uh-uh. uh-uh. Okay. And all right. Mean, so, no, Uncle, that's me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uncle Mike, why don't you break yeah. down? Tell, tell, tell us exactly what is going on between Wall Street versus Reddit. What is all this fever about and about GameStop? Help us understand. Okay, Okay, last year, we know everybody was inside and they were isolated. During that time, there was about 10 million people that got onto online trading, right? People had more time, so they wanted to do trading and they got they got online, they downloaded some apps for it, right? So it's now a lot easier for everybody to, to get on these apps and trade. There's also apps like Robinhood where they have commission free trading. So people are are using that. Along with other social media like Reddit, people are using groups and getting information to go back and forth on what stocks to invest in and and do stuff, stuff like that. So now you have these 10 million people, the 10 million new traders talking all together, doing um, day trading and, and using social media as, uh, as a collaboration tool for, for collaboration. Out comes a, a, sub, a, a subgroup called Wall Street, Wall Street Bets, okay? So Wall Street Bets- AKA WSB, this is WSB. That's where I'm seeing this all over the news. What yeah. is WSB? WSB stands for Wall Street Bets and it's a subgroup on Reddit. Yeah, okay. they are a bunch of day traders that pass information back and forth on what stocks to invest in and what they're all going to do. I know, I know some young investors, you know, 18, 19 years old, some of the kids I coach, and they've been in it for months. So this brings in GameStop, AMC, Bed Bath, and Beyond. So those, those are the types of, of things that they were looking at from a long time ago. And they were and telling they- me about this. And it, it seems too that all those those stocks are like legacy companies that had like a really, you know, footprint, a traffic driven footprint, like meaning that people had to go into the stores. And now that might not be the case because we're all pivoting towards online mechanisms for, for buying stuff. So like GameStop is video games, which we can buy online. And you mentioned Bed Bath & Beyond is retail mm-hmm. um, and that, you know, we, we can order online now. And then you said AMC, no one's going to the movies anymore. Right. So, yeah. So you picked it out. Those companies are companies that are not doing very well. And so what the hedge fund looks at, they look at those companies and because they're not doing very well, they do something called shorting the stock, okay? So hedge funds, they will borrow from the, from the stock and resell that stock at a certain price. And because the stock isn't doing very well, they're betting, it, betting on that stock to go down and then buy it at the price when it goes down, then when they pay back what they borrowed, they can keep the difference between what they borrowed it from and what they, when they rebought it from. For. Well, these hedge funds are betting on the demise of stocks. It, it kind of sounds like those haters that have been, you know, betting on, on, on Roz's decline, but she keeps per- <laughs> per- purveying with her, her strong IQ. Oh, keep, keep it going, Uncle Mike. I love where you're going with this. Keep it going. Yeah. So, so because they're betting it on it to, to, to go down, right. And, you know, making money from, from the difference, the change is what happened is these, these groups like from wall, wall street bets, they're a group of, of few million people that went in and purchased the stock. So these the retail head, investors, as they call them. Retail investors. Yeah. So it really becomes retail versus wall street at that, at that point. So you've you, got 10 million of these retail investors that are just people like you and I that are, are, are betting on Wall Street and they're going up against hedge funds with these professionals that all they do is watch the markets and make these moves. And now there's like an even playing field almost because of the internet. Is- yes. Well, because of the internet, it is, it is an even playing field. So, you know, in, the, in that group in, in Wall Street bets, I think there's about 3 million people that, that, are, that are in there. And when I say 12, 10 million, that was like everybody that's, that's come in all over the amount of time. But so these, these people in Wall Street bets, we'll just use them for, for the example right now. So 3 million of them, we'll say, are, are coming in and they, and they purchased the stock because, oh, I forgot to mention, GameStop is the most shorted fund that's out there right now, <laughs> okay? So it's something that they do often because that stock isn't, it wasn't, it wasn't doing good, right? I can't remember how much it was in the link, something like $4, $4 or something. Now it's like $300 or something. But anyways, 
they 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 went in and purchased these stocks. So the stocks now went up. So the hedge funds had borrowed it for a certain price, and now it's going up. So that means they're gonna they're gonna lose. But the people who purchased it are making money. So that's wow. how David won. Wow. Right? You know, there's been some interesting developments with all this. And one of the ones I saw was that one of these large hedge funds basically almost went belly up because these retail investors, you know, were able to, to, to fight against the short, um, you know, the, the, and the, the group, the hedge fund that almost went, um, you know, belly up is owned by a gentleman named Gabe Plotkin. Uh, he's also a minority uh, shareholder of the Charlotte Hornets basketball team. So he's one of Michael Jordan's business partners. Um, and his hedge fund was about to go belly up, um, but he was able to secure a loan from one of his buddies. One of his buddies lent him $2.8 billion to prevent from going belly up. So could you imagine finding yourself in a hole with your business and you can pick up the telephone and I could, you know, pick it up and say, hey, Ruby, you got an extra $2.8 billion lying around that I could just possibly borrow. You know, Lord things aren't going well over here. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even lend you like 500 right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's wild when you, when you, when you think about like billions of dollars, right? Because you know, we're used to dealing, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of the billions. So, you know, I like to do a deep dive and I like to look at these things, you know, especially as we talk about hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars. Let's quantify that a little bit. So if I had a million dollars and I wanted to spend that by spending $1 for every single second that there is every single day, it would take me 11 days to get through a million dollars spending that $1 per second. Now to contrast that to a billion dollars, if I did the same thing and spent $1 per second trying to spend off a billion dollars, it would take me 32 years to spend off all that money. So step back for a second and think about that. $1 million is 11 days, a billion dollars is 32 years for just 1 billion. Now this guy got a loan from his buddy for $3 billion. So this guy just let his friend 96 years of money that he could spend at a dollar a second, just 96 years. If you're a human, you're, you're lucky to live that long. But these guys are tossing around 96 years of money like it's pocket change. So just grasp that at its level. You know, the guy who he received the loan from, who offered him that, is a gentleman named Steve Cohen. And that guy happens to be the owner of the New York Mets baseball team. He also happens to be a former hedge fund manager who had a successful hedge fund. So successful, in fact, that in 2013, they were found guilty of insider trading, and he paid one of the largest fines in history of $1.8 billion. So we go back to David versus Goliath, the little retail investors versus these hedge fund managers, and you get a scale of what these guys are able to do and what level they're playing at. Um, it is incredible that this has been able to take place, and I've seen a lot of you know TV stuff where, you know, People are, are saying this is bad. And we've seen these billionaires now getting on TV and, and saying, hey, this is bad. You know, we're losing billions of dollars. Um, but it, it seems like, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And finally, little retail investors are able to get a big share of the pie that hedge funds have been able to, you know, access and exploit for a really, really long time. Uncle Mike. But they are, they're making changes. So even with, you know, these little investors you know, making this money, they're using applications from, from Robinhood. The day after everything went up, they were stopping trades in Robinhood. They weren't allow, allowing them to 
purchase anymore. They can sell their positions, but they couldn't, they couldn't buy anymore. TD Ameritrade and Charles Schwab also stopped the trading on there. But so, it's a free market. What do you mean? It's free. That's what it's supposed to be, but they're, they're, they're stopping these things. There's companies like uh, Melvin Capital and Citron. They both lost money in this as well. So those are the, so those are the, you know, the big companies that were shorting, um, uh, GameStop, and they they lost money. They they made major major losses. So you, you're going to see a little bit more this week as the positions have to be sold sold and 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 paid back. But they're they have eyes on it. You know, the SEC has eyes on it. There's some lawmakers that are having conversations with it. They're saying it's manipulating the stock. They think that some <laughs> professionals are part of the Wall Street bets, and they're helping them. So that that is uh, you know some manipulation that they're they're doing right so all these hearings and and you know changes they think that you know it's not going to last for how however wrong it's not going to be a long-term thing but they think that the people that are going to get hurt are the people that are in the um, retail trading wow well, I know that we'll continue to monitor this. Um, you know, there's a lot of information going around. It's certainly in the news right now. Even our own dear Ruby got caught up in the hype a little bit. So Ruby, why don't you share a little bit about what happened? And, um, you know, I, I know you are you have ambitions of being like Mr. Monopoly, um, you know, owning a large chunk of land and, you know, being a, an oil baron of, of sorts. But tell us how your, 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 your portfolio is going right now. Okay, so my stock portfolio consists of two stocks. The first stock I got maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, I picked up a tip at a wedding where the guy worked at Glue, which is a mobile gaming company. Wait a second, are you, this sounds like you're going down the path to admitting to insider trading. So I just, I just want to like, yeah. just get but that I out there. I, I wouldn't <laughs> say like he gave me any information that you wouldn't have been aware of other than oh, the fact. Okay. All he said was, I work for a, a gaming company that's, you know, doing really well. Public and information. Every, and everybody else started talking about, like, stocks. So me just being like, let me look this stock up. And at that time, it was, like, maybe, like, $2 or whatever. I still hold, like, it was $400 I think I bought the stock for. I just never sold it because I just let it sit in for a while. So now it's at... I don't know, $8, $9. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know when to sell it. So just sitting there because it was just $400. So you're going long. Yeah, I'm going long. I'm going all the way till, <laughs> till the same thing happens with glue. And then my family's really into, into the stock market. So dinner table conversation is always around stocks and which app do you use to trade your stocks. So I don't really have a trading stock like app. My brother was talking to me about Wealth Simple, so so I downloaded that app, and this is probably early conversation in January. But I downloaded the wrong app. I put money into Wealth Simple, so Wealth Simple has like a banking app <laughs> and a trading app. So I put in a sum of money into Wealth Simple, which is a banking app. So I couldn't trade, and then my brother was like, "No, you got to get in on this. You got." So I finally, oh. I finally got the trading app. But then when you transfer funds, it takes like three to five days for the funds to show. <laughs> and then now I'm in the midst of like this whole, you know, GE and AMC and BlackBerry. Like everybody's like, did you buy it? And my brothers were talking about how they bought it at $2, $4. And now the stock price is at, I think, $12 or 15 so my brother was like, get in on it, get in on it. I was like, okay, I can probably afford AMC because at this point, GE was like at $300. Uh -huh. I bought AMC stock at $16. And in the middle of the night, I'm also asking Mike about it. And he's sending me voice notes on what it, what's happening. And all I want to know is like, when can I sell? Because the stock just plummeted. And my brother's like, just hold it. It's going to blow up. Well, Friday passed. It is now the weekend. Nothing blew up other than my stock is still at like, I don't know, $12. I just want to get it to the $16 mark so I can get, get my out. money back. <laughs> That's it. So I don't, I don't understand. And it, and it is such a FOMO because I had my, my family talking about it and I'm like, I want in on this. But then I have no idea. So now I'm like going on to Reddit. I've never been on Reddit. What are these little kids talking about? Somebody tell me when I should buy or sell. What is happening? 
And then not only that, now I'm on TikTok and there's so many people. So many Everybody's young, on. It's so everywhere many, now. So many young people having a stock portfolio are like now advisors to the stock market. And I find myself listening to them and I'm like, wow, why am I not using my brain and just looking at the financials and the proper way of getting into the stock market? So I have two stocks, like I said, Glue, which I just don't even, I'm shocked that it's still surviving, and AMC. And I'm waiting for Monday just to get to as close to the $16 mark because apparently something's going to happen again on Monday. I don't know what's going to happen. What's happening? I've got, I got news for you. Um, you know, don't, don't feel scared. Uh, we're going to have a future podcast on financial literacy coming up. So you're going to get all the education that you need. I am waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mike, I, I cut you off a little bit there. I could, I could tell you were about to spit some fire. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to let her, let her know this week is a big week for this. I'm tired oh, of hearing that. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it is because those, those options that were, that were borrowed and sold, they have to pay, they has to be paid back. So it takes a few days for that to happen. And actually the contracts were up on Friday. It takes a few days for it to happen. So this week you'll see either up or down on things. So check like- Well, 30. isn't that every day you see up or down in the stock market? Yeah, but there's specific things <laughs> that you can predict. And, and these are the predictors for this, this week. And to, to our listeners, uh, just remember that none of us are licensed uh, financial advisors or anything like that. So, you know, invest at your own peril. Um, yeah. We are not responsible for what takes place. <laughs> I am definitely not somebody to listen to if you want to invest your money. <laughs> Guys, AMC is a movie theater that's been shut during the whole pandemic. What do I do? <laughs> Let me go invest. <laughs> So in the next segment, we're going to be talking to Dennis Mitchell. He is the CEO and CIO of Starlight Capital. He's one of the visionaries behind the Black Opportunity Fund and a truly special guest. We'll be right back. Today, we have joining us Mr. Dennis Mitchell. He is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer of Starlight Capital and the co-founder of the Black Opportunity Fund. I am super excited to welcome you to our podcast as our first interview guest and I'm ecstatic to interview you because ever since I saw the Black Opportunity Fund and did some research on it, um, I think it's the answer to uh, some of the problems that have been plaguing the Black community. So Dennis, first off, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Um, so I, I wanted to, to jump in and, and, and talk about the Black Opportunity Fund because I know what it is, um, but our audience doesn't. Um, and after reading up, it, it brought me back in time because I remember uh, years ago when my father and I, we had a small business and we were looking to expand and we went to the business development bank and we weren't able to secure funding to scale our business. And, um, you know, that, that really threw a monkey wrench into our plans. So could you just tell us about the Black Opportunity Fund, tell the audience about it and um, just elaborate on, on, on the, the wonderful work that you're doing? Sure. So there, there's three pieces to the Black Opportunity Fund. There's um, who has started it and what drives it. There is the dynamic partnerships that they'd like to that we would like to strike to fund it, and there are the vectors that we would like to affect change through. So beginning with the first piece, uh, there were 51 of us who got together, and 51 of us who were Black leaders, Black professionals across the country who signed the press release that was released on June 25th of last year to say that we were standing up the Black Opportunity Fund. And there were a number of tenants that the Black Opportunity Fund was going to operate by, one of which is that we are going to be collaborative in everything we do. So we spoke to a number of community organizations. We spoke to a number of individuals before we announced to let them know, hey, this is coming. And we're not looking to push you out of the way or to usurp all of the great work you've been doing for decades. We wanna partner with you. We see your expertise, we see your excellence, we see your brilliance. What we wanna do is take you out of an endless fundraising loop that prevents you from executing on your mission and vision. And we wanna be that permanent pool of capital regardless of business cycle, regardless of political cycle, regardless of economic cycle, we wanna be that permanent pool of capital that exists to aid black businesses and black organizations. And when, when you look at the major challenges that we face as a society, whether it's different forms of racism or sexism, um, whether it's the pursuit of higher education, whether it's the uh, pursuit of, of vaccines and therapies to treat different conditions, 
All of those battles are fought with the aid of a permanently endowed fund, right? Hospitals have them, universities have them, anti-Semitism, sexism, all of these different scourges on, on humankind are all combated with the aid of a permanently endowed fund. And so it's high past time that anti-Black racism was combated with the help of a permanently endowed fund. So that's, that's the first piece, sort of the foundation of what it is we're building. The partnerships we want to strike are strategic in nature, and we've identified government, business, and philanthropy as the three major strategic partners that we want to engage with. And we're looking for strategic contributions into the Black Opportunity Fund. Not one check for $10,000. we are looking for multi-year commitments so that we can in turn make multi-year commitments into the Black community. And so far, the receptiveness has been fantastic. We've partnered with a collective of 50 Black fundraisers from across the country. We have engaged with the Canadian Foundation for Community Foundations and their 160 members. And we've engaged with hundreds of businesses across Canada and over 30 of them have already begun supporting the Black Opportunity Fund. And we've wow. engaged with government at all three levels, federal, provincial, municipal, across four different um, federal parties, if you will. And uh, again, the receptiveness there has been fantastic. And then finally, the change we wanna affect is we wanna provide capital for black led businesses and we wanna provide um, capital to black community organizations, be they not-for-profits or charities. And again, you know, you, you, we've heard, you know, your story, Jordan, is not unique. Um, and that's not to marginalize your story, but we hosted a, a black business town hall. So this is part of our community engagement, part of our not displacing people, and importantly, not speaking for the community, but being a platform for the community, right? We would never presume to say we know all of the challenges that face all types of black people in this country. I was born here. You know, there are people in the Black Opportunity Fund who were born elsewhere. There are, you know, our diversity is tremendous. And so as part of the Black Business Town Hall, we've now engaged with over 500 Black businesses across the country. And we were told not just that there's racism, but the challenges that they face getting capital. So in some instances, they're involved in businesses and sectors that traditional financial institutions haven't underwritten and so are not comfortable underwriting. You know, because of the relative lack of intergenerational wealth in the Black community, there's less friends and family capital in Black businesses when they go to seek out traditional financing sources. There's um, no boys club. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. And so what we want to do is we want to break down those barriers. But in addition to providing capital, we want to wrap our arms around these companies and we want to take them on a journey. We want to take them from where they are now to making them bankable, investable, and then transforming them into extremely desirable commercial clients of the traditional financial institutions. And by doing so, create intergenerational wealth. And then on the community side, there, you know, we've had a number of town halls. We've done two education town halls, a healthcare town hall. We'll have a, a justice town hall coming up. And the learnings we've heard from those town halls, but importantly, the connections a number of these organizations have made through participating in our town halls it's been incredible. And so, you know, we're well on our way to partnering with a number of community organizations around the country. And one of the challenges these organizations face is that a number of them either can't afford or don't have the bandwidth to get charitable status. And so they are locked out from traditional philanthropic channels for raising money. And so what we are going to do is we're going to create infrastructure that will help these organizations become charities but we will also work on getting money to non-qualified donees, like, like not-for-profits, to ensure that you know, the capital that we've raised flows to where it's needed. So when you put it all together, you know, we've tried to build a diverse collective that truly reflects the national black, um, the, the, the national black community. We have established strategic partnerships for funding, and we have taken our time in listening to the national black community so that we know exactly how to craft solutions that actually address the needs in our community, both economic and social. So it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, I hope everyone's had a chance to see the 100 day report that really chronicles what we've done so far and our learnings and more importantly sets the stage for what we intend to do for decades to come. And it's my fervent hope and wish that my grandchildren take the Black Opportunity Fund for granted because it's always been there. Oh, yeah, that, that's good. Dennis, we um, might have to rename you to Stevie because you just, that was like Stevie Wonder <laughs> music to my ears, brother. That is amazing. <laughs> oh, uh -huh. I love it. I love it.
Yeah, so I, I just want to. We try. I just want to add that. So I was on the town hall for the business town hall that was across the country, and I have never seen a Zoom session with so many faces like mine. And yeah. just looking at it, it gives you so much power inside to to say, "Hey, I can I can do this," and it also answers the question or, or also helps you out and say. Hey, I'm not alone because there's a lot of questions that were happening on those on those calls where I thought, oh, I don't know how to do this or I, I, I'm not the only one. But now there's other people. And ever since I started doing this, since I started talking to you and getting involved um, with 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 this and going to the meetings, there's new people that I know. It's expanding my network and being able to say, hey, I, I can I can do this. So, you know, anything that I can do, just like we're talking here now. To spread the word, I, I, you know, I'm fully behind it. Well, I appreciate it, Mike. Mm-hmm. Uncle so, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dennis, as you know, like our, our podcast is, is all about, you know, society and culture, you know, speaking about matters for society culture, but also the way that technology is kind of like involved and in how that fits in. Can, can you like speak about some of the entrepreneurs that you've been meeting that have been from a tech background? Yeah, um, you know, the first name that comes to, to mind is Lekin Olawoye. I'm going to butcher his last name, but Olawoye. And Lekin is just, he's behind the, the, um, the BPTN network, um, oh, Black Professionals and Technology Network. And I mean, you're going to call me Stevie Wonder. I don't know what you're going to call Lekin because he is truly a prophet um, and, and truly an inspirational speaker. But, you know, if you, if you listen to him about his life story, um, and coming to this country and then, you know, sort of the educational journey that he's been on and then building BPTN. Uh, he's truly an inspiring guy um, and still so young. Uh, so really inspiring to, to even old guys like me. But um, he, he is somebody that we want to further enmesh into the Black Opportunity Fund because he represents uh, exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, too often, when people talk about empowerment in the Black community, it devolves into this discussion on, on justice and, and uh, incarceration rates and such. And, you know, that, that's certainly an issue. But we have to start moving beyond things like that. We have to start talking about building wealth in the Black community, you know, harnessing our excellence, our brilliance, our work ethic to, to really create, you know, lasting, lasting economic testaments to the fact that we were here and we are here and we'll always be here. And Lekin is someone who's on the forefront of that. And he talks about something, uh, he calls uh, he calls it uh, tri-sector athletes. And I gather that he's, uh, he's gathered it from someone else. But he talks about people who are able to sort of blend the entrepreneurial with the economic, with the social, and, and to almost be a modern Renaissance person, if you will. And uh, he's just such an inspirational guy and somebody that you want to get involved in the Black Opportunity Fund. And, and certainly your initial question was about technology. He, he is a technology professional. And, you know, technology is something that I use all the time. Everybody uses it all the time. But he, his understanding of not just the, the essential technology we use all the time, but how we should be harnessing it going forward uh, to not just create wealth, but to just create jobs and, and enterprise mm-hmm. in our community. You know, he's somebody that I could spend all day talking about and with and for and on behalf of. So those are the types of guys that I think of when I think of technology. Okay. That's a person I actually want to meet then. Ah, definitely. <laughs> uh, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was browsing your website. I was on Starlight Capital's website and I was, I was looking over everything. I was just pouring through. And I, I noticed that your team is so diverse. Like it seems like you've got every checkbox of person working for you. Can you like talk about some of the tangible benefits that your organization has, has realized because of having such a diverse team? Yeah. And, and let me stop for a second and just say, um, it, it wasn't by conscious design. All right. I mean, when you, when you look at corporate websites and you read through their material, they always say the same thing, right? We recruit from the best schools or our people are our competitive advantage and yada, yada, yada. Um, at Starlight Capital, what we did was we said, you know what, first and foremost, we have to put together a team of professionals who can stand working with each other for 12 hours a day, because this is a startup and we're going to spend a lot of time yeah. with each other. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so that meant that we mined our own networks for people that passed, you know, people who were smart enough, hardworking mm-hmm. enough, but really and truly, we wanted to make sure we could work with these people for 12 hours a day. And so in mining our network, by default, we got a diverse work team, we got a diverse team. 
you know, on, on the investment team, there's myself as the CIO, you know, Varun is, is from India, well, his family is from India. Um, Michelle, Michelle likes to point out that she's the rarest of, of minorities because she's a redhead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there just aren't, uh, there aren't enough women in asset management. Uh, our trader, Will, is, his family is from China. Um, you know, you start going through the heads of the operational units, Halcyon, who heads up finance and fund accounting as a black woman. Um, Marco is a, is a differently able gentleman who heads up, heads up investment administration. Chuck Jang, his family's from China. He had, sorry, he heads up investment administration. Marco heads up client service. Um, you know, you go, you go, you go on and on through the list and, and we just have an extremely diverse team. And it's, and it's because first and foremost, we said we need people who are smart enough, hardworking enough but it was really the culture that we wanted to build. Yeah. And, and we just continue to attract more and more diverse candidates for every role that we open up. Um, it was kind of a, a kind of a running joke that uh, we need to, we need to find somebody who's uh, we need to find more left-handed people and we need to find, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's just, we needed to find a few more vectors to make sure we truly had diversity of cognition and diversity of thought and problem solving, but we're off to a great start. And th I think, because we've got so much diversity of thought, experience, and and problem solving, it's one of the reasons why Starlight Capital has gotten off to such a great start in terms of performance, in terms of asset growth, and just in terms of the brand that we've created. So thank you for, for noticing and thank you for highlighting that. That's good. Ruby, did, did you have a question? I saw that you, you raised your hand. Yeah. So to your, to your point, Dennis, a lot of organizations, you know, really push that we're trying to be diverse we're trying to be inclusive and, you know, a, bigger corporations have these moonshot goals and they're still trying to get there. So it's very impressive that, you know, you've been able to uh, cultivate that through the network and through just within the internal, internal engagements and people that you, you know, through, through, um, through your own kind of diversification of people, you know, right. Yeah. So, I guess my question for you is more along the lines of like you mentioned having women in asset management or even in technology. That's what we've noticed. Are there things that you are actively doing to attract that or to provide support for women leadership or women getting into asset management or even um, overall for technology, the angle that we look at? Yeah, and, and really, uh, I'm going to disappoint you, I think, because there's no algorithm or, or something crazy. We just, we talk, to, we talk to our teammates. We talk to our team members. And, and here's the thing, and this is uh, applicable to companies of all sizes. But if you talk to the people in your, in your company about people that they know that we should recruit, you'll get an avalanche of high quality people. Because, I mean, in our industry, in, in, in financial services and asset management, you know, we deal with regulators, we deal with law firms, accounting firms, we, we deal with custody firms. And inevitably, if I went to Halcyon, who, who heads up fund accounting and finance, and I said, Halcyon, we need to find um, more fund accountants. Immediately, Halcyon would have 5, 10, 20 different names of people. And inevitably... There'll be some candidates who just wouldn't make their way to the recruiter or wouldn't pass the normal HR screen. They're great candidates, but they get screened out either overtly because of, in, you know, you can call it unconscious bias, but, you know, here I think we'll just state what it is, uh, racism, right? Um, and, and simply, you know, the difference in how somebody who's black or somebody who's a woman or somebody who's gay approaches applying for different jobs. But by virtue of going directly to my team and saying, give me the names of people you want to work with who, you know, you've encountered who would be great for these roles, you'll get a ton of names and they will inevitably be diverse. So that's what we've done. And again, you know, the diversity of our team, I'd, I'd love to say it's by design, but it's just become organic because I feel we truly recruit the best people for our culture and our culture is a diverse one. Thanks, Dennis. Okay. No, that's, that's really good. Um, I have a question first and then um, Roz has one right afterwards. I just want to know, you know, although you're using the people inside and you're creating that diverse culture within your company, do you ever look at 
um, something like the Onyx Initiative. Um, I know we've talked before, and you know, uh, Wayne, is Wayne, somebody that I went to school with, I've known him for for a long time. I just want to know if that's something that is, you know, in your future, or even putting it with the Black Opportunity Fund, something like that, or partnering. So yeah, that's a great, great segue. I actually referred a very large financial services firm to Onyx yesterday. Uh, Uh, Yeah, because what I found in asset management and real estate is the first thing that comes to mind for these these employers is, well, internships, right? Mm -hmm. um, We've we've got 10 or 15 at at Starlight Investments, which is our parent company. Mm -hmm. uh, We bring in between 15 and 20 interns every summer. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that uh, other than my nephew, um, I don't believe any of them have been black. And so one of the first questions was, well, can we diversify the intern pool? And so I've, I've referred them to Onyx. I've referred them to Icon Talent Partners. You know, Derek Raphael has been oh, around yeah. for mm-hmm. a while. He's doing a great job. Mm-hmm. And so this is an example of how Black Opportunity Fund works. You know, we could have, we could have set out to create our own BIPOC recruitment agency. Um, but why? There are other groups out there. There are other Black recruiters, headhunters, talent scouts, if you will, out there who have been grinding away for decades. Why wouldn't we just partner with them and lift them up? Exactly. You know, that's, that's one of the things that the Black Opportunity Fund really, really tries to do is to lift other people, organizations, communities up at the same time. And so, yeah, Onyx, Icon, these are, these are all examples of firms that we have already partnered with and will continue to partner with going forward. So, Dennis, when, when I see well, strong... Hold on, hold on there, Jordan. Hold on. Roz is next in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ongoing thing there. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank Keep you. me honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I, I was actually going to talk a bit about the diversity, equity, and inclusion that you were talking of. Um, that's the field that I work in now. And so a lot of the times when companies are depending on their network to give referrals, it's actually the complete opposite of what you've described, right? It's usually from what I've seen in technology and finance, it's a lot of white men referring more white men. Yeah. And, uh, and that in itself is the problem as to why they cannot have a diverse company. Yeah. Um, and so what what I have seen is that it, it takes branching out, working with, with companies like the ones that you mentioned, working with mine to figure out, to find new networks that they can build on and, and start target, targeting those audiences and working with them. Um, and you already answered my question <laughs> in what you were saying with Mike, uh, working with Onyx and other companies. Yeah, no, Roz, you, you have a great point. And so the challenge becomes, you know, the, the normal mechanism for these companies to, to fill, especially senior level positions is, um, well, I went, to, I went to this school, I went to, you know, I went to this university, I went to this high school. And so uh, I'm going to recruit from those schools because they're the best. And it just locks in this perpetual cycle of recruiting, as you, as you pointed out, largely from one race and one gender as well, Roz. Um, so the fact that, you know, my network from the companies that I worked at was diverse to begin with. So we could organically rely on referrals from a diverse team to create an even larger diverse team. But what I would say to a lot of these companies is shake that up. Why not recruit from schools that have got a more diverse student base? Because let's be real here. I, I, love, I love the accolades and the kudos, um, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not significantly smarter or harder working than most of the guys you're going to find on Bay Street. Okay, certainly, um, you know, if you were going to compare me to the, the smattering of, of black professionals on Bay Street, you're going to find all of us are pretty hardworking. All of us are pretty diligent. And, um, well, I might score in the bottom quartile, but all of us are fairly <laughs> smart, right? <clears throat> The, 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 the difference is, is that the difference is, is that for us, in terms of sort of building up that network and community and getting more and more people who look like us onto Bay Street, is we need those companies to recognize that there's an equal amount of talent in our community, whether it be people of color, black people specifically, women, LGBTQ, and then to seek out sources of those people right? Talent is normally distributed. You're just as likely to find an idiot doctor as you are to find a brilliant, you know, garbage yeah. collection of sanitation <laughs> yeah. worker, right? And, and, and it's distributed normally across races and genders and, and sexual orientation and, and primary language and country of birth as well. So if you're limiting your recruiting to one gender and one race, 
you're significantly limiting the chances that your business is going to truly have the best people. Wow. You know, Dennis, I've seen you on BNN. I'm so happy that you brought up the smattering of, um, you know, people of color and black people on Bay Street, because, you know, when, when I see strong leaders like yourself, you know, it, it always makes me wonder what makes, make, what makes you tick. So I, I have to ask the question, is the elephant in the room, you know, how did you start? Why finance? And, and like, how does a kid from the GTHA become the CEO of a, a Bay Street firm? Uh, so I, I grew up knowing with 100% certainty that I was going to play professional football for a living. And so, you know, six knee surgeries later to on both knees, um, oh. you know, here I am. So it, it really comes down to finding your passion. And passion is now one of those cliched words. So I'll define it. Passion is that thing that you want to do with all of your spare time. Right. You know, you look, you look at Bill Gates, um, Bill Gates, when he was a kid, all he wanted to do was code. You know, he used to wait in line outside the computer lab to get screen time and computer time so that he could code, code, code. Right. Every we live in Canada, every NHL hockey player will tell you they used to play hockey on the backyard rink or, or wherever from sunup to sundown. Right. Um, you whatever that that describes what you're passionate about. And that's what you should be doing. So for me, it was football. And then for the longest time after football was taken away from me, I, I didn't have a passion. So I kind of wandered around. And, and um, one of my undergrad profs was always talking about Warren Buffett. And so on the way home one day, I picked up a book uh, at chapters called Buffettology. It's written by Warren Buffett's, um, you know, his son, Peter, got divorced and it was written by Mary, his former wife. And so I read that book cover to cover that night. Um, it's only like 150 pages. It's not like I read 700 pages in one time. <laughs> but I read it cover to cover that night and I rediscovered my passion. Um, I wanted to be a money manager. I wanted to manage money like Warren Buffett. And to the extent that I could, I wanted to follow in his footsteps. And, but that was a lesson I had to learn. I get, I get every day, I get at least five emails or reach outs from LinkedIn from younger black or white or female professionals who want to, you know, it, it starts out the same, you know, I, I admire your career. I'd love to sit down over a coffee and talk about your career. It doesn't really work because my path first off isn't available to anybody just getting into the industry. Okay. And, and that's why I, I'm deviating here. Warren Buffett started managing money on his back porch for his, for his neighbors who included two families that would, well, two people who would go on to be the CEOs of Coca-Cola. Mm. You know, in this day and age, no one's giving you money you know, to manage on your back porch. Mm. Like that's not happening. So his path isn't wasn't available to me. Similarly, my path is not available to a lot of people out there. I'm going to guarantee you that no company is going to turn over a mutual fund to a 32 year old guy with no experience. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So what I what I say to people is, you want to talk to the research analysts, the investment analysts, the people who just got in because they can tell you what path they took, what education they needed, what experience they needed, what skills they needed to demonstrate to get in. And then after that, the path is, is pretty well laid out. So for me, reading that book reignited my passion. And then even from there, it took me six years to break in. You know, there isn't a company on Bay Street that doesn't have a one pager, a three pager or a five pager from Dennis Mitchell on Walgreens or Walmart or Coca-Cola. I, I wrote them every day. And so going back to passion, every day after work, I'm researching stocks, writing reports, firing them off to companies, demonstrating my skill, my passion, my conviction. And um, eventually, it re well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, even despite doing all of that, it didn't work. What actually worked for me was, was, you know, you can say flipping the script or whatever, or changing up your cards that are dealt to you. But what I did was I tilted the odds in my favor. I quit work and I went to York and I did my MBA. And the reason I did that is because I wanted companies with jobs to come to me ah. and after them all the time. So I tilted the odds in my favor and <clears throat> I searched out companies that manage money like Warren Buffett. Because again, that tilted the odds in my favor. If you're a fundamental analysis guy and you're pitching stocks to somebody who's a, a technical analyst or a momentum guy, it's not going to work. You're going to recommend stocks that they don't want to buy and they're going to make you look at companies and or do work that you can't do or don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So I found fun companies that manage money like Warren Buffett and I just attacked them. You have to be relentless because this business 
you know, they make it seem sexy on television, right? You have two phones, bye, 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 sell something. <laughs> <laughs> you want a dinner and, you know, everyone's got like a, gla- a, a crystal decanter full of expensive brandy or scotch in their office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that's not what this real world is like. What the real, what the real asset management business is like is, is sitting in front of, in my case, six screens, but usually two screens, watching information come in, reading reports. And if you're lucky, you get to type numbers into a spreadsheet and then meet with a management team. But I would say for every 10 or 15 companies you analyze, you, you, you actually get excited about one. So, so it's not a fantastic ratio. So, you know, for me, you know, doing my MBA at York and getting the companies to come to me, I got a job that then allowed me to bootstrap a, a rotation in asset management that allowed me to bootstrap a rotation in equity research that then finally led to the job at Century. Wow. Century, what a lot of people don't realize is when, you know, getting in is just the first step. Then you've got to stay in because everybody wants in, right? The jobs are glamorous and they pay well. So everybody wants in. So you got to perform while you're here as well. And, you know, it, it's like a shark. If you're not moving forward, you're dead. So you <laughs> I love that. And you've got to generate results and you, you've got to justify your existence because especially at the big asset management firms, you know, when people start looking for synergies and, and start looking for that last 20 basis points to get to that 12% ROE, so everybody's options kick in and, and people can start buying boats and cottages, you know, <laughs> you don't want to be that last 20 beeps that gets them over that, that hurdle rate, right? So you got to perform while you're here. So you got to know the industry, you got to stay on top of it, you've got to generate returns, you, you, and, and you've got to have some luck, right? I mean, if you'd started in this industry in 2007, you'd probably done in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, market, the market crushed you, right? Uh-huh. It's like you're sitting at your desk and somebody's walking around saying, there's a, a buck 25 we can save and there's another 90 <laughs> we can save, right? Uh-huh. So for me, it was, you know, people wait around for, uh, for something, you know, the opportunity or money or, or what have you. And I didn't want to wait. To me, opportunities are, there are only two types of opportunities. Ones you take advantage of and ones you don't. And so I, I was given an $8 million fund and I was told if I didn't make something of it, they were going to take it away and destroy it. So I, I built that up into a $1.5 billion fund. And then they said, okay, well, here's a $30 million fund that blew up. So what can you do with that? And I built that into an $800 million franchise. And they said, here's a $60 million franchise that is really screwed up. What can you do with that? And so I turned that into an $800 million franchise. And then they said, you know what? It would be nice if you could do what you did with your team for the entire department. And so I became CIO. And they said, okay, do that for the entire company. And so I became EVP. And so it just, it it progresses. And like I said, you got to be a shark. You got to keep moving forward. There's always got to be something you're striving for, pushing for, trying to get to. So all of the perseverance and relentlessness that you use to get in is what you got to use to stay and move forward. And it's especially true for black professionals. Like I, I, whenever we do articles like this and they're in the globe, um, inevitably, if you read in the comments, there's always someone who comments, well, he's doing, he's doing well. So clearly there's no problem with racism. Oh, and, hell yeah. Uh, so uh, ignorant. Oh, really, man. The, the analogy I make is, you know, if, if you and I are running a hundred meter race, you know, and you start at the 40. And I start at the zero, you know, at the goal line. And, uh, and I have, I've got work boots and a backpack full of sand on, <laughs> right? If I beat you to the finish line, that's not proof that it was a fair race. It's just proof that I was that much faster than you, right? So my success isn't proof that racism doesn't exist. My story tells you about all of the things that I had to overcome to win this race. And one of those things was racism, anti-black racism. So, you know, that, that's the thing, especially for black professionals, perseverance, relentlessness, always create value so that there's a reason for you to stick around or for them to keep you around. Cause everyone's always looking for 25 beeps to hit that hurdle. <sighs> wow. 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Listen, Jordan, oh, when you're around for 45 years, you'll have some good stories too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm learning from Mike. Cause this guy is just a wealth of stories like we could have a whole separate t- like time to get together and just listen it's, to my it's talk. another show they're all lies <laughs> 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 okay so okay we've heard about business what do you actually do for fun though like what do you do in your spare time uh, i I'm, I'm the opposite of a, of a renaissance man i like to keep it simple um one i live by all these little tenants so the the next one is i keep my interests narrow and i pursue them deeply so i i like wine 
I, I discovered wine at the Super Bowl of all places. And uh, I came home and I, and I read and educated myself on wine because wine is one of those things you can make really expensive mistakes on. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then I, you know, and, and I'm somebody, I have to be careful what I get interested in because I have a very obsessive personality, which works really well for money management, but can get you into trouble in your normal personal life. So and drinking, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I turned the cold cellar into a wine cellar. I have a wine cellar downtown. I have just north of 500 bottles and, um, you know, I enjoy sort of the intricacies of understanding the different types of wine and different terroirs, different countries, how those wines have, have uh, you know, have evolved over the years. So I immerse myself in that. I have a reading list that's at least a hundred books long all the time. I, I, you know, I switch from fiction to, uh, to, to historical, well, I, I switch from fiction to business and back and forth. And, and I think that's important because your mind is the most important muscle and you've got to constantly keep it engaged. You've got to constantly keep it um, sort of flexible and malleable. So the fiction that I read is to kind of give it a break and a, a break away from all of the heavy lifting it has to do with annual reports and, and company and company filings and such. But um and then my kids, man, my, my daughter's 18, you know, I got to keep a, a sharp eye on her and, and my son's 16. And so, you know, they're, they're at great ages where I spend my time, you know, teaching them things. So yeah. about investing, how to drive a car, um, all of my life lessons that I've learned, I try to cram into their heads every time I see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first they got tired of it, you know, but then as they started, you know, following closer, like the gap between someone who's two and someone who's 34, 32 is huge, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, you're trying to impart lessons, but, you know, there isn't any relevance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the gap between someone who's 18 and someone who's 45, now they start bumping into the stuff that you did that matters, right? So how to, how to navigate through Frosh Week, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. courses, right? What you should be doing with all of that money that I saved so that you could go you to school. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. right? yeah. So now the lessons are more relevant as they start living through some of the stuff that I said. And, and as they start to see some of the challenges that their friends have that they don't, don't. now they start to build a healthy respect for the stuff that you're telling them. So now they want to hear it, yeah. right? Teaching them how to drive. Now, all of a sudden, they want to start listening to, to what you have to say. So, you know, I spend, I spend as much time as I can with them. I love to travel. I'm learning to cook. You know, I'm, I have a greater appreciation for my mother. She passed away a few years ago, but I, you oh, know, I made uh, an that. initial foray into cooking soul food. And so that's going, that's going well. And uh, my girlfriend was, was kind of surprised at the quality of the, of the Jamaican soup that I put out. This <laughs> uh, That'll uh, keep the colds away. Uh. Yeah, I'd love so, to do a podcast yeah. from his place, and he he caters everything. <laughs> and, and you know, our, on our resident team here, Roz is quite the chef, so we should connect you with her because her recipe and her Instagram go deep with some of her recipes. Just truly well, delicious. Roz, hey. Roz, I suggest you follow Ray Williams on Instagram. Grazer eats. Um, Ray is an incredible chef. Um, most of the time when we ask him what he's making for dinner, none of us even know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> but if you follow him on Instagram, so I'll follow you and you follow him. Um, okay. between the two of you, I'll, I'll see what kind of, what type of food I can get up to. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I, I keep it pretty narrow. I'm a pretty boring guy in my downtime. Oh, and cycling, cycling. That's something. Oh, Yes. I got. Uh, I have the two bad knees, so I I can't be I can't be taking Taekwondo or UFC <laughs> yeah. or any of that stuff. So I, I cycle up and I live by the lakeshore in Toronto, so I, I cycle up and down oh, the lakeshore I, all the time. I did a lot of cycling there last last summer, right? Yeah. So there was a there was a bike club called the Mandem Bike Club. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'd go with Chris and the, all those guys, and we'd go from you know right from the bridge all the way down to um, DVP down there, but. It, these yep. areas where I've never seen, and I would have never seen them if I wasn't on a bike, right? So, yeah, so I've gotten everybody in my family into cycling. So now uh, you'll see me and my brother and his two son, two of his sons and, uh -huh. and my son. And well, I'd say we're flying along, but we're, we're making good time. That's that's what we did. And, and so that's what I do when I go downtown. But, you know, I live in Mississauga. And so we have a little group here in Mississauga, and we call it Old Foot Bikers, right? And so we have these guys. <laughs> we go ride the trails all the time. And, and you know, it's it's fun getting it in shape and everything. But exactly. you know, it's it's a it's a good, good thing to do. What's up, Roz? 
Um, I, I have a question for you because I'm feeling super inspired. Um, and when I feel inspired, I want action. And so I would <laughs> love to hear some advice for that you have for young people uh, that I can apply to uh, in, improve my financial future. Sure. So I, I would say that there's there's two things that you can do. And one is, is really obvious and the other is probably a little counterintuitive. So the one that's obvious is just read. OK, because I mean, truly and really and truly, I think uh, too many young people get their their news or information or learnings from TikTok or Instagram or Facebook. And look, I get it. Reddit. I'm old. I'm, yeah, Reddit. Yeah. I, I, and I get it. I'm old. Right. And, and I like to read books and that's how I was raised. You know, my kids make fun of me because I, I tell them about when I was in university, about how I was excited when I got to Laurier because the microfiche was connected directly to the printer. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, I need you to print out G7 for me, please. Uh -huh, yeah. You could just print it yourself. And they laughed and they said, why don't you just Google it? And I was like, Google didn't Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was still, a, was still a military tool then, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I get it, you know, different, different eras, different tools, but nothing at the end of the day, nothing beats reading and getting your information from official sources. So that's the first thing. And, and what reading allows you to do is it allows you to do two things. It allows you to stand on the shoulders of giants who came before you and allows you to rent somebody else's brain and intelligence. So, that's what I always say. There are tons of books that are timeless classics that will, will never fade away and contain, you know, so much information. So I, I would say, like, read books and educate yourself on the basics of, fi of, of, of uh, personal finance and investing to begin with. And then over time, you'll, you'll start to gravitate towards either a type of investing or an area of the market and just immerse yourself in that because there's more than one way to make yourself wealthy. And then the second thing I would say that is a little more counterintuitive is network across. Because what I find is that young people like to headhunt when they network, right? I, I, I got this CEO in my network on LinkedIn, or I went to see this chairman or whatever. And that's all well and good. But you know what? Um, you know, the, the guy who bankrolls Starlight Capital, Daniel Drimmer, he's 48. He and I are contemporaries. And uh, he and I, um, you know, the first transaction we did together was in 2010. You know, I wrote him a check for 35 million bucks when he IPO'd a company. And here's, here's a tip. When you write somebody a check for 35 million bucks, they become your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe guy. that. You'd, you'd hope so. <laughs> uh. but, but, you know, what ends up happening is, is that I, you know, I gave him a really hard time in the due diligence process because I manage money for, for you guys, right? And so I can't afford to overpay for stuff because, you know, not everybody's got the ability to make three, four, 10, you know, NBA folks making 40 million a year to play a sport. Not everybody has that ability. So I can't blow up their hard earned money. So I gave him a hard time on the due diligence, but it, when it was done, I wrote him a check for 35 million and he respected that. He respected the rigor of the due diligence and he respected that I followed through when he followed through. And so we established a relationship. And so now he's paying me back by bankrolling Starlight Capital and he's showing faith in me. So I say network across. Because all of the, you know, my CFO and COO, Graham Llewellyn, not only did we work together for 10 years at, at Century, but we went to elementary school together. I've known that guy for 40 plus years, right? So these are the people that you're going to make the most important deals of your professional career with, your peers, not some, not some CEO that, you know, you read about in a book or not some chairman that you saw on CNBC, your peers. So network across. What does Mike want to get done? What does Amsoko want to get done? What does Jordan want to get done? What does Roz want to get done? And how, you, how can you guys work together to pull each other along towards your longer term goals? So those two things, educate yourself through reading <laughs> and then um, networking across so that you build the alliances and partnerships that will get you across the line. Awesome. Reminds me of, of a Oh, sorry. I'm just going to say thank you so much, Dennis. I really appreciate that. I have to drop right now, but thank you so much for the great advice. It was great seeing you. Great to see you again, Ross. So you, you touched on something there. Uh, it was a great piece of advice that I got back in the day. It was cooperate to graduate. And somebody told me that my first year in college and I applied it and, you know, I got a study group of friends and we helped each other out and we graduated. So yep. I appreciate that. Um, Ruby, I know that you have a question. So, you know, we'll turn it over to you. Who's this Ruby? This is Amsoko. But it, she's got a lot of names. Yeah, yeah. I th we think that she's hiding from somebody, you know? Yeah, there's something yeah. going on. 
she's I a law am, graduate so that went to school I'm, in Australia, and you know, there's just a whole bunch of things. But we like having her around. <laughs> I, I like to keep it creative and interesting. <laughs> so, so Dennis, actually, uh, stemming off your uh, comments right now, and I really reflect on the education piece of getting the knowledge behind how to financially support myself, how to financially grow. So just want your thought and opinion on why isn't this taught to us in, in the school systems? Oh. Um, and, and even when I, I uh, initially, when I graduated uh, high school, I went to York and I pursued a business degree, but even in that context, um, it didn't make sense to how to financially support myself and to set myself up. It was, yeah, I, I was reading economics, but it was more of like, how do I get a job in this, but not how to It wasn't about personal apply it. Finance. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And that is a crime. Like literally, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. All of us are going to figure, have to figure out bank accounts, right? We're going to have to understand how to manage a household financially. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget, um, I, when I was working in a different firm, uh, one of one of my colleagues came to me and said, my parents are making me move out. And I was like, hold on, you still live at home home? I'm <laughs> 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 yeah, sure they're making you move out. You're a grown ass person. You yeah. Know? Hey, I'm a, I'm a brown girl. I live at home forever. <laughs> yeah, but you just don't go to your apartment. <laughs> yeah. well, it I, doesn't but, matter. So, so I said to her, I, I said to her, I said, okay, well, you need a real estate agent, you know, to find you a place. And she's like, what are utilities? And I go, I don't know, probably for, you know, a, a 2000 square foot place. It's this for gas and this for hydro. And she goes, no, no, no. What are utilities? Uh -huh. Oh my uh -huh. goodness. Wow. You have lived a sheltered existence. It doesn't matter who you are though. You're all going to have to figure out at some point how to pay a gas bill, you know, an electric bill, a, you know, cable bill or, or a high speed internet bill. You're going to have to manage your finances so that there's money left over after paying all of those bills to, I don't know, put in the jar for the travel fund or for the education fund or the retirement fund. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. We all need those basic finance, you know, personal finance skills. And the fact that it's not taught to us in school, which by definition is supposed to give us the skills to be productive. <laughs> right? By definition, uh, right? Uh, it's like, it's like if, if somebody went to med school and they didn't teach you about medicine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Went to law school and they didn't teach you uh -huh. about the law. You're going to school to learn how to, well, to first to learn how to learn, but then, you know, the ultimate goal of being a productive member of society, n none of that happens if you can't look after yourself financially. So mm -hmm. it is a huge gap that I understand, at least in Ontario, they're starting to make strides to address it. But why there isn't some sort of national curriculum that includes truly basic fundamentals including personal finance is beyond me. Uh, and, and also, and also being able to pay your bills on time and realizing what impact that has to you and your credit score. If, if you default on your yep. mortgage payment, like that, to be honest, those aren't things I thought about when I was younger, when I had my first credit card, I'm like shopping spree. But if somebody sat me down and, and I wouldn't be in this uh, situation with the stocks right now if I knew how to <laughs> play the stocks <laughs> with all this uh, GME and AMC going on. But, well, but I'll tell you, if, if, and, and even for people who don't listen, because let's be real, like if we truly look back on teenage M. Soko or teenage Uncle Mike or teenage Dennis, I don't know how much attention we were playing to, oh, you've got to learn about your credit rating and you've got to pay bills yeah. on time. So for, this, for the few people who are truly paying attention and, and get and understand that that matters, that's fantastic. But even for those of us who don't pay attention, if it does come back to bite us, right? You end up with an R9 on your credit rating. Mm -hmm. At least then you know the steps to sort of repairing that, yeah. right? Or, or at least you can understand that you can make up for it in other areas. If you got an R9, you better be saving more than five or 10% of your paycheck every week or every two weeks, because you're going to need to pay more for, you're going to need to pay for more things with cash, right? So mitigation mm -hmm. techniques, the more you understand the system, the more the system works for you. The least you under, the less you understand the system, the more the system works you. It's, it's almost as if, you know, you're intentionally not taught about the system so that it could take advantage of you and line the pockets of others. It's <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you that is true in some instances, 
Um, but you know what? All of us have a responsibility for looking after ourselves. If you, if you think that, you know, I, I used to do this at conferences in business to explain how I approach, you know, running money, not just in my fund, but for the companies that I, I manage. And I would say to the audience, I'd say, how many of you woke up this morning and your first thought was, how can I make Dennis Mitchell rich? <laughs> and, and it was shocking how few other people put their hand up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my point is, is that the, the idea that other people are out there just to like help you out and to lift you up and to and to be your best buddy and to sacrifice what's in their best interest for your best interest. You know, there are people out there like that and God bless them. But most other people are trying to figure out how they can get ahead. Right. And so you should similarly be thinking that way. And I'm not I'm not saying that all of us should be predatory and all of us should be looking to, to take from Peter and Paul to, to give to us. But what I'm saying is, is that there's nothing wrong with looking after your own financial well-being. And, yeah. and, you know, I think every financial planning seminar begins with some sort of mantra about pay yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. I think some of the good things that are, are coming up, even so let me backstab the Black Opportunity Fund. It has mm -hmm. different things that it's trying to do. Over the last weekend, it had the education summit. Right. And I was I was Second part one. of that. Huh? The second one. The second one. Yes, that's right. That's the second one. So this is the one that I was doing that was happening on, on Saturday, just last Saturday. So the first one, the first one was geared towards educators. Uh -huh. This one that we did on Saturday was geared towards parents. parents. Yes. So I went in where, where as, a, as a parent. So I have two kids, similar age to you, 18 and 15. Right. And I thought it was so good, the things that they were talking about. So, you know, the financial literacy, not even only that, but something that we can do as an advocacy group as parents. How could we help the, the schools? We're talking about, you know, Black history. Why is it Black history? Why isn't it just history? You know, the different things that the schools should know, how the teachers are to, you know, treat your, treat your kids, right? You know, there's a cultural difference. They don't know this cultural difference, so how are, how are they going to do it? You know, this is why your kids are treated different. You know, it could be Billy that grew up in a farm way out up north, and he comes to Toronto to now teach. It's a culture shock for him. You know, it, it's almost, I don't even want to give it a fault or whatever, but he just doesn't know. He's not, he's not he's not first in dealing with other cultures. So th those are the things that they had, had spoke about. And I, I think, you know, with the help of the BOF and, and building groups like that with the parents this time, um, I, I think it, it, it will do well. And, you know, yeah. financial literacy. Like one it, of the, well, one of the learnings that came out of the, the breakout room I was in was mm -hmm. understanding how to advocate properly for your children. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, there, there were, there were, and there were different uh, ranges of advocacy. Like there was a woman who in my breakout room and she's like, I'm that parent hiding in the bushes and behind the wall. And then this. And I was like, uh -huh. wow. okay. <laughs> there were, there were, there was another woman in the room and she's just like, I'm not prepared to do that. But, you know, I, I'd like to understand whether there's, you know, what I can do about, you know, them suspending my child. Mm -hmm. So there's a great discussion about progressive discipline and the discrepancy between progressive right. discipline regimes implemented against black children versus, you know, white children. Mm -hmm. And so for her, she wanted to understand and get information on how the system progressively disciplines so that she was armed so that she could push back because she mm -hmm. doesn't want her child suspended for two weeks. Of That's course not. That's ridiculous. That her, that her child is, she, she didn't get into the details. But the, the whole point was, is that she felt that her child had been overly disciplined for what had happened. And she wanted to know what her recourse was. And so what, one of the ways the Black Opportunity Fund can help parents in that situation is to be a resource. You know, where she, she, had, she didn't even have a clue as to where to go to get information. Mm -hmm. So the Black Opportunity Fund can be a resource in that manner in saying, listen, you, your child goes to school in Peel District School Board. Here is what the progressive discipline regime should be. Here are the superintendents that are responsible for your school. And you know what? Here is a template of a letter that you should be writing to that superintendent, to the principal, to the guidance counselor to get a reaction, first off, attention, <clears throat> and to resolve this issue. Because yeah. you know what? If schools know that you're an engaged parent and mm. they know that you understand how the system should work, Mm. you will get more respect and you will get more adherence to that progressive system and to that the regime. And yeah. that's, I think, what all parents want. 
They want their child to be looked after, to be safe, to be educated, but they also want to know what, when inevitable mistakes are made, it's not fatal uh, right. or not life altering for their child. That's true. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the big question. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've danced around it. Um, what are your thoughts on what's going on Reddit versus Wall Street right now with, with GameStop? Uh, we, we have to know from, from your, your brilliant mind. Um, Help me make my money back. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you don't have to make your money back the way you, the way you lost it. Uh, that's, that's one of the lessons they do teach you when you study for your CFA. So what is happening here is that um, the regulators, in this case, the, the SEC, the stock exchanges, they, they, they were caught with their pants down. And in turn, so were a whole bunch of hedge funds. Yeah, let me digress for a second. When you when most people understand buying stocks, right? You buy a stock because you think it's going to go up for one reason or another, right? Could be squiggly lines on a chart, could be a whole bunch of research you did. So when you go when you buy stocks, that's called going long, right? You own the stock, you make money because you bought it low and you're going to sell it high eventually. Shorting is the opposite. Right? You find a stock that you think is overvalued or is headed for, for trouble. And so you sell it high and you buy it back low. Right? And so GameStop and AMC Theaters and, and other companies that have been swept up in this Reddit craze um, are companies that have historically been in structural decline. Right? My kids, when they game, they don't go to, to, they don't go to GameStop. They don't go to EB <laughs> Games. Right? They, they stream the game. They download the game. And uh, as for merchandise like Funko Pop, you know, that company's publicly traded. You can buy their stuff on Amazon. So GameStop is a company in structural decline. And the hedge funds know it. So when they have these, you know, hedge fund summits, and they all go to Davos and they pop, you know, $10,000 bottles of <laughs> Chateau Margot and, you know, and they, and they share stories. And then they all go home and they all put on the same shorts. And so it should be obvious that you can't buy more than 100% of the shares of a company that's outstanding, right? If Microsoft is 1,000 shares outstanding, people can only buy 1,000 shares. Similarly, wow. if you're going to sell shares short, you shouldn't be able to sell more than the outstanding shares of the company. So where the regulators and where the hedge funds were caught with their pants down is that in a number of these companies, because they're all drinking the same Kool-Aid or, or Margot, <laughs> um, they sold, in the case of GameStop, 136% of the outstanding shares short. And that shouldn't be able to happen. So, uh, you know, some retail investor somewhere noticed this and started a discussion about it. Hey, if 136% of the shares are short at, and the stock has cratered, at some point, these guys are all going to have to buy the stock to cover their shorts. Because remember, in shorting, you sell high and buy low. So if the stock's already gotten really low, these guys just figured, I'm going to buy the stock in advance of all these other guys buying the stock. <laughs> and ah. because they don't go to Davos and pop bottles, they're all in a Reddit, they're all in a subreddit forum, right? So that's how they share the idea. And so it's not five guys worth a hundred billion. It's, well, at last I saw 5.2 million people each with yeah. 10, 12, you know, 15 grand. It almost equals out. Yeah. <laughs> and so... These guys are like, we're buying the stock. It's worth more. Just buy, just buy. And if we keep buying, the stock's going to keep going up. So buy, buy, buy. And of course, the hedge fund guys are not just, they haven't just sold 140% short. They've also borrowed massive amounts of money to short the stock because money's cheap, right? The Fed's right. keeping you know, policy rates at zero. And other parts of the world, you know, long-term bond yields are negative all the way out to 10, 15 years. So money's dirt cheap. So these guys are levered up. So they can't push any more shorts. They can't. They don't have any equity and they can't borrow any more money. So they're, they're out there at the mercy of these guys buying the stock like crazy. So, of course, you saw Melvin Capital and some other hedge funds say, we need money, right? So the guys that they were popping bottles with in Davos, they call them up and they're like, listen, I need $2 billion or I'm out of business. And the guy on the other end of the line is like, well, that could be me on my next trade. So, yo, here's $2 billion, but... You know, when I need you two months from now, you better be there. <laughs> so, you know, so these guys are helping each other out. The problem for the small folks is that as egregious as the shorting was, their buying has been equally egregious, right? So GameStop is not a $400 stock, 
It's just not. You can't yes, make a yeah. fundamental argument. And and I saw Mark Cuban on CNBC yesterday trying to make this argument about GameStop. Well, they did 600 million of e-commerce sales last quarter. If you annualize that and this guy, that was the most, you know, Mark Cuban's a smart guy. He's mm. made way more money than me and he's created way more jobs than me. So I, I'm, mm. I'll give him his props for that. But that was the most ridiculous fundamental analysis I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and if I was on the panel with him, I would have smoked him. Like you <laughs> Mark Cuban's head on, on the wall behind me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I read that article and I was like, oh, Mark Cuban said this. So maybe it's, maybe I'm good. I'll stay. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Mark Cuban's analysis was absolutely ridiculous <laughs> in terms of GameStop. And I, I would have owned him and you'd have seen his head on the wall back there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that as egregious as the selling was, the buying was equally egregious. And the problem becomes that the smaller guys in the Reddit shop do not understand the market as well as the big hedge fund managers. So mm -hmm. with Robinhood saying we're suspending trading in GameStop, it wasn't because Robinhood was trying to screw the little guy. Robinhood has to post capital and collateral with other dealers and market makers mm -hmm in order to execute these types of trades. And so everyone's like, well, Robinhood was poorly capitalized. Okay, GameStop's trading volume surged 10X yeah. and the stock yeah. went up at one point over 2000% year to date. You can't no plan for that. <laughs> prepared, like if you think of normal distributions, this isn't two standard deviations. This is like eight standard deviations. Like you need, mm -hmm. you need six pages of graph paper <laughs> together to get this normal distribution, right? Uh -huh. nobody, nobody capitalizes for scenarios that far out on, on the fat tails, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Robinhood did what they had to do. Interactive brokers did what they had to do. And this is, this is the small guy not understanding the market, the fundamentals of GameStop, how the market works in terms of collateral, and eventually understanding that they're going to run out of money before the hedge fund guys do, right? Because the hedge fund guys can, can tap each other. Um, they, can, they can draw down lines. And at the end of the day, if I'm Melvin Capital with $12 billion of capital and, and I trade, you know, X number of shares through JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley every year, they're going to hook me up. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, more so than Robinhood is going to hook up some, some guy in his basement who's got you know, his last 10 grand. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for the little guy, they're not going to win this battle. The system doesn't want them to, and the fundamentals are not in their favor, and money is not on their side. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to win this battle. But I will say this, Sam Soko, um, the market will give you a chance to buy fantastic businesses like Apple, like Nike, like Starbucks. And I mean, you talk about easy lifting, like that's not heavy lifting. These are great businesses that you patronize all the time. Like Uncle Mike said it, yeah. I wear a Nike shirt every time he sees me, right? Yeah. I own the stock. I, I bought my latest tranche in April. That stock's up 70% mm -hmm. since then, mm -hmm. right? We go to Starbucks all the time. I got to think when the all pandemic the time. is done, people are still going to go and pay six bucks for a cup of coffee and they'll actually be thrilled that they can do so. So go buy Starbucks, right? All these come Apple. How many Apple products do each of us have, right? <laughs> My son's um, buying one today. Yeah. So these <laughs> yeah. are the companies you want to invest in. And if you're unsure, then you need a bigger margin of safety. And the margin of safety comes when markets sell off. And I know people get worried, but I'm not telling you to go buy Tesla when the market sells off. I'm not telling you to go buy GameStop. I'm telling you, you know, Apple's going to be around. You know, Nike's going to be around. You mm -hmm. know, Starbucks is going to be around. Go buy those companies when the market sells off and then turn off your screens for two months, three months. You come back and you'd be shocked at how much money that you've made. My, my own son said to me, he goes, those numbers don't seem real. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. they're very real, my friend. And this is how I put you through school. This is how I'm going to put you through school. Mm -hmm. There's so, thanks for lesson, that. education. You do not have to make your money back the way you lost it. Okay. So don't be sitting around trying to make your money back in GameStop. Go find another business whose products so, you so all the, the time so the, that you understand and buy that stock. So the funny thing, because my brothers are really like in the hype, they've been in this Reddit group and all of a sudden it was just dinner table conversation. And I was like, I got to get on this. <laughs> and then, so today I was like, how do I get it back? And my brother's like, how much did you put in? And I'm like, well, only about like a thousand dollars. He's like, are you kidding? You're acting like you put in like tens of thousands of dollars. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's still a thousand dollars that, you know? <laughs> Hey, look. Risk it, tolerance. It, it, yeah. It, it, <laughs> priorities. You know, I, I helped out a, a, a 
so my son plays basketball and one of the kids he plays with um, his mom came to me and said, what should I be doing here? And uh, I told her, I asked her, you know, what her financial sophistication was. And I told her, I said, for most people buying a passive index ETF is the right way to go. So it took her forever to open up her brokerage account, but it just worked out that she was ready in like late March, early April. So I just told her, I said, go buy the S&P, S&P 500 ETF, right? Hedge it to Canadian dollars, right? Buy that version of it. And then whatever you put into it, just forget about it for six months. And she called me the other day and she goes, I put a thousand dollars into it. Now I have 1500. She goes, when things open up, I'm going to Cuba. I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like good yeah. for you. I'm, I'm happy for you. you Natural know? trend up. <laughs> yeah, that, that five hundred dollars means you know different things to different people. Yeah. You know, like five hundred dollars, I might be able to buy a couple of textbooks for my kid. <laughs> so mm, that'd be fantastic for, for her. She's going to Cuba, Mexico. I'm happy for her. Mm. Cool. There's, there's absolutely nothing more I can add, Dennis. This has been an incredible interview. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Time, guys. I, I, I hope uh, I hope I was able to add some value for, for your listeners, subscribers. And um, if there's anything you guys want to follow up on anytime in the future, I'm your guy. Okay. So when, when when things open back up, though, I want to come by your office because that view looked amazing from the boardroom. <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, we've taken so Starlight, Daniel Drimmer, never he's never slipping, never sleeping. So because the building is only about 10 percent occupied, he's taking this time to renovate the, like the all three towers. So I don't even have an office right now. Wow. Uh, he's just, he's gutting like the whole thing. But you know what? Those companies that do come back, rents are going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Probably. So uh, Daniel may only be 48, but he's got more than three years worth of knowledge and experience on me. And it's a pleasure to work with him and, and to learn from him. And this is a great example. So we, I'll take you up on that. I'll, you know, I'll, we'll have you through at some point, but you know, I have no idea where my office will be. In the <laughs> well, listen, guys, I got to jump between yeah. four thirty and five thirty. I got to go for a walk with the lady. So okay, and then that's it starts good. all over again with BOF at five thirty. So I gotta, I gotta hit my time slot. Okay, no, that's yeah. perfect. Well, I got. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Dennis. You have a great day. Enjoy your walk. And M. Soko, you've inspired me. I got to come up with like a podcast handle for myself or something like that. <laughs> I'm just yeah. trying to make sure that I, I keep my artistic uh, efforts alive because yes. you know, it can't just be about the work and to your point about passion. So we'll, we'll, so we'll see where that leads me. So but thank you. This is awesome. All right, guys. Have a great thank morning. Thank you. Take care, Dennis. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. This has been the Technically Diverse Podcast. Remember to hit subscribe on whichever app you prefer to get your podcasts. You can also connect with us on various social platforms. On Twitter, you can follow us at Technically D. On Instagram, you can follow us at Technically Diverse. Or if you prefer to watch, subscribe to our YouTube channel that shares the same name, Technically Diverse. We also love getting feedback and ideas. So if there's anything you'd like to see, you can send us an email to technicallydiverse at gmail.com.